At the height of the jet age, airlines wanted one thing – long-range flights without the fuel bills of four engines. The answer was the Tri-J, a three-engine marvel that carried millions across oceans, yet within just two decades it was gone. What changed so fast that airlines abandoned what once looked like the future? The story of the Tri-J begins in the 1960s. Aviation was booming, but rules were strict. At the time, twin-engine aircraft could not stray more than an hour from a suitable airport. Regulators demanded redundancy. If one engine failed, there had to be enough power left to make a safe diversion. That rule closed oceans to two-engine planes. Quad jets like the Boeing 707 and Douglas DC-8 could fly across, but they drank fuel at alarming rates. Airlines wanted something in the middle. Three engines looked like the perfect compromise. Boeing made the first breakthrough with the 727 in 1963. It wasn't a long-haul giant, but it proved the idea. Three engines mounted at the rear gave it enough thrust for short runways and high-altitude airports like Denver. It could reach further than smaller jets but cost less to operate than a big four engine. The rear-mounted design freed up the wings, improving lift and handling. For airlines, this meant reaching new markets that larger jets couldn't serve. The 727 soon became a backbone of domestic networks. Over 1,800 were built, a record for the era. Its success convinced manufacturers that the three-engine formula worked. But the 727 was only a taste of what was coming. The real battle was for the long-haul market. In the late 1960s, American Airlines wanted a plane smaller than the 747 but capable of non-stop international routes. Two U.S. manufacturers jumped in. McDonnell Douglas designed the DC-10, while Lockheed built the L-1011 TriStar. Both were wide-body Tri-Js that could carry 250 to 300 passengers across the Atlantic. Each carried three high-bypass turbofan engines, two under the wings and one at the tail. Lockheed took a bold path. The L-101-1 used an advanced S-duct to feed air into the tail engine hidden inside the vertical stabilizer. This gave the plane sleek lines and quiet performance. It also introduced advanced technology like automatic landing in zero visibility and triple hydraulic systems. Pilots loved the way it handled, and passengers called it one of the smoothest rides in the sky. But those innovations came at a cost. Rolls-Royce, the sole engine supplier, ran into financial trouble during development. The RB211 engine proved more complex and expensive than expected. Rolls-Royce nearly collapsed, requiring a government bailout. The delays crippled Lockheed's schedule, and airlines that had shown interest began turning to the simpler, faster-to-market DC-10. The DC-10 was less elegant but more practical. Its tail engine sat higher with a straight intake. It was cheaper to build, easier to maintain, and quicker to deliver. Airlines placed orders quickly, but its early years were haunted by tragedy. In 1972, American Airlines Flight 96 suffered explosive decompression when its cargo door failed. Two years later, a Turkish Airlines DC-10 crashed near Paris after the same floor led to total loss of control, killing 346 people. In 1979, American Airlines Flight 191 lost an engine on takeoff in Chicago, rolled upside down, and crashed, killing 273 people. Even though some incidents were blamed on maintenance errors, the DC-10's reputation never fully recovered. For the public, three engines suddenly looked less safe, not more. Yet the market still believed in the Tri-J idea. McDonnell Douglas fixed the design flaws and kept selling DC-10s. Lockheed fought to recover, but delays and high costs haunted the L-1011 program. Boeing watching from the sidelines, considered its own wide-body three-engine design during early 7x7 studies. But instead of committing, they focused on twin jets, betting that technology would soon allow two engines to do the job of three. It was a gamble that would pay off. So why did the trijet fade so quickly after dominating the 1970s? The answer lies in economics, regulation, and technology. First, fuel. 
The oil crisis of the 1970s quadrupled the price of jet fuel. Airlines suddenly cared about every drop. Three engines burned more fuel than two. Maintenance costs also stacked up. Three engines meant three overhauls, three sets of spare parts, three chances of something going wrong. When profit margins got tighter, the math stopped working. Second, regulation. In the mid-1980s, the FAA introduced ETOPS, Extended Range Twin Engine Operational Performance Standards. For the first time, well-built and well-monitored twin jets could fly routes previously restricted to three or four engines. ETOPS 120 allowed two hours from a diversion airport. Then ETOPS 180 extended that to three hours. Suddenly, a Boeing 767 or Airbus A310 could do almost everything a Tri-J could, but with less fuel and lower costs. By the 1990s, ETOPS expanded even further. The third engine, once a ticket to cross oceans, became unnecessary. Third, technology. Engines became far more reliable. In the 1960s, in-flight shutdowns were common. By the 1980s, failures dropped to near zero. Modern engines reached power levels designers of the 1960s could not imagine. For example, the GE9X on the Boeing 777X produces over 134,000 pounds of thrust, more than the combined output of the three engines on an early DC-10. That kind of leap showed airlines that two engines were not only enough, they were better. The economics were brutal. A Tri-J typically consumed 20-30% to 30 more fuel per seat mile than a comparable twin. Over decades of operation, that translated to tens of millions in added costs per aircraft. Airlines no longer wanted to carry an engine they didn't need. From the perspective of a chief financial officer, dragging a third engine across an ocean was like buying three spare tires for every car in a fleet. There was also psychology. For decades, passengers believed more engines meant more safety. Four was better than three, and three better than two. Airlines leaned into that belief. They marketed trijets as safe, reliable bridges across the ocean. Through the 1980s and early 1990s, many passengers still carried that mindset. But as ETOPS approved twins completed long-haul flights with reliability, confidence grew. By the late 1990s, comfort, entertainment, and ticket price outweighed engine count, leaving the Tri-J without its old psychological advantage. McDonnell Douglas tried one last time with the MD-11 in 1990. It was a stretched and modernized DC-10 with winglets, digital avionics, and more efficient engines. It promised lower fuel burn and long range, but it missed performance targets and arrived just as twin jets like the Boeing 777 proved unstoppable. Only about 200 MD-11s were built. Most went to cargo carriers. Passenger airlines quickly moved to twins. Lockheed never recovered. After the L-1011, it left commercial aviation entirely. Boeing absorbed McDonnell Douglas in 1997, ending the line of Douglas Trijays. By the 2000s, the Trijet was already a relic. Still, they did not vanish overnight. Cargo carriers embraced them. FedEx and UPS used DC-10s and MD-11s for years thanks to their large cargo holds. Some were converted into aerial firefighting tankers, dropping thousands of gallons of water over wildfires. The last passenger trijets flew into the 2000s tens, but today, spotting one in service is rare. The legacy of the trijet, though, is lasting. They proved that medium-sized wide bodies could work across oceans. They introduced advanced systems like Autoland and new levels of redundancy. And maybe most importantly, they made regulators comfortable with the idea that fewer engines could still mean safe long-haul flight. Without trijets, ETOPS might have taken longer to arrive. Without them, twin jets like the 767, 777, A330, and A350 might not dominate today's skies. Think about the irony, the very strength of trijets, the extra engine that once made them necessary, became their downfall when technology caught up. They solved a problem for a specific time, and once the problem was gone, so were they. Look at the sky today and you'll see the results. Two-engine aircraft flying 15 hours non-stop, crossing oceans, deserts, and polar routes. 
The twin jet became the answer, but it only became possible because the Tri-J once filled the gap. The Tri-Jet era lasted about four decades, short compared to other designs but unforgettable. For those who flew them, the memories remain strong. Pilots praised the L1011's smooth handling. Passengers remembered the DC-10's wide cabin and distinctive tail engine hum. Spotters still feel a wave of nostalgia when they see one resting in a desert boneyard. Every generation of aircraft has its moment. The Tri-J's moment was brief, but powerful. It bridged the gap between old rules and new technology. It carried millions safely across oceans when no other option could. And though the skies have moved on, its shadow still lingers over every long-haul flight. The rise and fall of the Tri-J is more than a tale of engines and wings. It's a lesson in compromise, timing, and progress. Sometimes an idea shines bright not because it lasts forever, but because it arrives at the perfect moment. The Tri-J was that idea. A symbol of an age when three was the perfect number.